everyone. A very warm welcome back to The Doctor Will See You Now. So for our session today, we have a very interesting configuration. I feel quite privileged to think I'm being joined by two absolutely amazingly talented women. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome back Fiona, Fiona Erskine. Hi, Fiona. Lovely to see you. How are you? Good. Thank you, Jackie. But I'm even, well, if I'm allowed to say this, Fiona, I'm even <laughs> more excited because you had a wonderful idea. And you said, Jackie, why don't we invite on to the discussion as well the person who's now doing my audio books? And I'm so glad that you did suggest that, Fiona, because it brings a beautiful aspect to our conversation. And it's going to mean that we can find out so much more about this entity known as audiobook, which I know for many of us, it's a way that we're now enjoying uh, books, you know, given various different aspects of our life, that to be able to listen to a story uh, is, is just wonderful. So it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Gabrielle Glaster uh, into the consultation room. Gabrielle, you are most welcome. Thank you for agreeing to do this. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yes, I'm delighted to do it because I'm an avid, avid reader, not, not always a reader out loud, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, for, for those of you observant uh, viewers, um, you may recognise Gabrielle, because I've said a most amazing, talently gifted person. So, Gabrielle, to give your long list of, <laughs> of, of, of creative wonderment, we'd be here a long time. But will you allow me to say that you were... Uh, an absolute star on Brookside for many years. You had a stint in Corrie, <laughs> Family Affairs, and I think my favourite, if I'm allowed to say, was your rendition of Bob in Blackadder. Um, thank you so much. I know that you've appeared in the West End as well and done an immense amount of rep. So thank you for all your performances on the stage and the screen. Uh, and even more, Thank you, because I listened uh, to Fiona's latest book, which we'll be talking about. Uh, let's hold it up and look at its gloriousness, The Chemical Cocktail. Uh, and I want to thank you for your, your rendition of this. Um, I'm finding that I, if I'm listening to books, they're staying with me a lot longer. I'm going to return to you, Gabrielle, and ask you about your process, uh, if that's all right. We'll do a little forensic uh, looking at that. <laughs> but first of all, just to, just to come back to Fiona, and for anybody who's with us who isn't familiar with Fiona and her work, just to say that she's a professional engineer and writer based in Teesside, northeast of England. She grew up in Edinburgh, studied chemical engineering at Cambridge University and has travelled the world working in fertiliser factories, oil terminals and international construction projects. Her first thriller, The Chemical Detective, was published in 2019 by the Point Blank imprint of One World, with the second in the series, The Chemical Reaction, published in 2020. We then had a little break from the series with a fabulous standalone, uh, Phosphate Rocks, A Death in Ten Objects, glorious, glorious novel, published by Sandstone Press. Uh, and now we're back with publication by Point Blank again, as we say, Chemical Cocktail. And we're back with that amazing protagonist, Jack Silver. Fiona, I want to thank you for giving us you know, a protagonist that we are just dying to know what she's up to. No sooner has one story finished and we have a wee bit of chance to catch our breath and you send us again on the most thrilling of thriller rides with the way that you write. Um, if I can start by asking you about the title, why the choice this time of a cocktail? Great question. Um... So I have some influence on the titles and Point Blank have decided that it's going to be The Chemical Something. I think I said to you before, the, the last in the series will be The Chemical Toilet. <laughs> um, but um, uh, The Chemical Cocktail was partly because it is set in Brazil. And um, anyone who's been to Brazil will know that that combination of a cachaça rum and fantastic tropical fruits makes for a brilliant set of cocktails, caipirinha being my favourite. Um, 
And so, yes, and also there is a bit of a jumble of events. So our cocktail was quite a good kind of mix um, of all the different things that were going to happen. So, yes, that's um, that's where it came from. Mm, beautiful. I'm glad you point to that idea of that mix or what appeals like a jumble and, and and where does that take us? I'll come back and ask you a little bit about the, you know, those narrative strands that you've woven together and the format in which you do them. But before we head there, I wondered if for anybody not familiar with the series, you could just give us a, a brief introduction to how th this character that you've created who is as as the you know the bio information of this character says she's a chemical engineer and an amateur detective talk to us about jack silver i guess um my yes jack silver is everything i'm not in that she's tall she's sporty uh, she's really good at skiing which i'm not um and also she is uh, extremely extremely brave um in the, in, in the kind of work environments that she finds herself in. So I've worked in a lot of places where I send her, but I torture her a little bit more than, than you know, I might, I might torture myself. <laughs> but my interest was always white collar crime. So, you know, a lot of crime fiction is about there, but the grace of God go I, you know, but people who've fallen on hard times or fallen into bad company or have addictions um, and, I was really interested in legal crime, in, you know, crimes against the environment, crimes against uh, whole populations. And the fact that there are people who get away with staying inside the law, but are about as immoral as they come. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's where I wanted Jack to be. And I also wanted her, to, I wanted her superpowers to be in her brain. So I wanted her to be able to use her smarts mm -hmm. rather than her muscles um, to, to whop the baddies. Um, and also I wanted her to be a sexual being. Mm -hmm. So I got fed up with books where the opening paragraphs so the opening paragraphs are about raped and murdered women and I wanted sex in my book to be something that Jack has agency over mm -hmm. so it was very important to me also it's quite fun to write yeah I was gonna say you know not everybody who endeavors to include that aspect in their work you know makes it happen and you <laughs> most certainly do and, and I really appreciate that uh her approach to sex um and you know how she feels about it and thinks about it um yeah 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 i i think in a different life i i, I think i would certainly have been a jack silver probably have to lose a little <laughs> bit of weight now as well to be able to, to move as fast as she does but but yeah um so if gabrielle if, if i could ask you at, at this point um getting to know Jack Silver, uh, having read two of the novels now, um, can you remember what your first impression was of this character? I actually, I mean, I think she's a lonely soul. She's tough as old boots, obviously, and she lives her life 100%. I mean, her family are so ghastly. <laughs> Yeah. It's just horrible, aren't they? I, I think, yeah, no, I mean, she's great and I can picture her very clearly in my head. You know, she she physically leaps off the page for yeah. me. Yeah. Um, I mean, God, anybody being a chemical engineer, I, I couldn't do any science at school myself. So it's it's completely beyond me what she does. And that's such an alien world that Fiona writes about. All, all the, you know, the labs and the mines and the what have you. Um. But no, she's great, and it is great to have a feisty woman who's not particularly dependent on any man, though, you know, takes a fancy to quite a few of them. <laughs> but with the one weak spot about her son, that's her, yeah. that's her, yeah, Achilles heel, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking as well when you mentioned, I, I know when I first got to know Fiona's writing, and I've always been a staunch person of the arts, and thinking, oh, this is going to be, I'm not going to enjoy this. But I think you you write in such a way, Fiona, as to open up that mysterious world. And it's like, oh, really? I'm remembering in in, in Chemical Cocktail where uh, Jack's taken off on a plane 
and you bring in the information about how how it works. I can't remember the principle that, that, that lift, you know, the pressure and, and the speed and things like that. Benuli, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just amazing. And of course, Jack's too, got too much on her mind to actually be thinking about that principle right now. But I love how you bring that thing to us because I I know, like you know, sitting on a plane now, and that will that will stick with me anyway and it's, it's, it's just interesting how then scientific things which when I was at school there a thing in the textbook what has this got to do with me what on earth has physics got to do with my life and actually this shows how it does pertain to your yeah. life that, it affects everything you do whether it's yeah. boiling a kettle or whatever yeah well yeah. that's lo lovely to hear because that was definitely a very strong motivation I really wanted to make the things that really excite me I wanted to make them accessible to people who maybe will put off science because everyone can do science it's just that we'd had some of us had you know rubbish teachers um and so yeah so it's love it's lovely to hear that that that's the fun bit I mean I, I Jackie and I've talked before but Primo Levi who wrote um, among other fantastic books wrote a book called The Periodic Table has got the most wonderful stories about his time as an industrial chemist and and they just leap their poetry. They just leap off the page. And I, you know, I'll never be as fine a writer as him. But that that was my kind of guiding principle. That right. you know, if he can make a story about an onion in a in a resin factory interesting and engaging to kind of you know six year students, then you know that's 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 where I want to be. Cool. Wonderful. Yeah. So so Fiona, book book three, which you know when when an author sets off on a journey with a character and will, will that character actually lend itself to more stories well here we are I'm so glad that Jack Silver does lend herself to that um, and every book is special and every book is important but book three for you in the bringing together of this story what are, what are you most proud of? Golly um, I had a lot of I had a, it was probably a harder book to write um, in some ways. And I think it's partly because when you start off, you're just having so much fun um, that, the, you know, the words fly off the page and then you spend 10 years editing them. <laughs> but um, I think with 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 this book, I had a fairly strong idea where I wanted to go Um with book one, I sort of end up in Chernobyl. With book two, I end up in the Banchow Dam. With the Brazil book, I didn't have such a strong um, industrial accident. I mean, I, I do cover in the next book, in the Chemical Code, um, two more mine disasters in, in Mariana and Brumadinho. But um, I think with this one, um, it kind of ran away with itself. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, book four is the second part of book three. And so finding the right point to stop it was, I guess, the hardest thing in the end and this one. And also I have a love-hate relationship with most of the places that that, that I write about, um, you know, because my travels to, to Brazil or China or, or India tend to be to the places that no one else wants to go. Yes. Nobody yeah. really wants to go to um, to, to Panki in, in Uttar Pradesh to... to uh, to work in a resin factory um so that i i you know i tend to see uh different sides than maybe you would see when you're when you're traveling as a tourist but i think that the 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 rich poor divide in brazil was the one i almost found the most shocking yeah. um and and it's not as extreme as you find in some other countries but it, the, the kind of the, the the struggling middle class who are dependent on the state system for transport or for schools are probably the hardest done by of anywhere I've ever seen. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it, it was a kind of a bit of a love hate um, with Brazil. It's a lovely place to go as a as a wealthy tourist. It's a pretty tough place to live. And and there's the, the, there's a, a there's a it's almost like a, a repeated message that comes along at various points in in the text of how you know owning a gun there and people losing their lives it's you know it's 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 every day yeah. um you know and, and that how you know that strikes jack and let's face it you know jack's life is not one that is free from from strife and conflict and difficulty but, you know, it just resonated what you said with me about, you know, how difficult life can be, uh, you know, 
for the everyday people um and, and I think I think in all of my books and it, it wasn't deliberate I'm aware of it now but in all of my books it's kind of a little bit of my experience at the beginning in that being a very pampered business class traveler staying in nice hotels being driven around by a kind of a local minder you know being 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 looked after as a foreign expert visiting a country and then going off on my own travels and and kind of discovering that you know it is a lot harder when you don't have all that stuff so I think in all of the books there is that journey from being a kind of pampered visitor to somebody who's actually trying to and of course I've never had to fight my way out of a country but <laughs> I let Jack do that for me. <laughs> Phew so I'm, I'm glad to know that. Um, I, so, so coming back to the audio book Gabrielle for those of us who enjoy but are very very unfamiliar with the process um, can you tell, so for example, how long do you get to look at a text? Do you read it all before you begin recording? Yeah, you absolutely, that is a cardinal rule. I do know, I mean, there are famous stories of, you know, of actors who haven't quite properly read it. You get like three quarters of the way through a book and then it suddenly said, and then he went back to his Scottish roots and you went, yes, I've, I've not done him Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't you can't risk that I will you have to I mean I'm a very fast reader I, I read a lot anyway so that's fine as to prep different people do different amounts I'll be absolutely honest we're not paid for that you are paid per finished hour usually okay so uh -huh. whatever the length of the you know how you know if the whole book takes three and a half hours then you're paid for that amount of hours if it's taken you three weeks to do it, you are paid the same. It pays to be good-ish at your job. Yeah. If you stumble a lot, if you have to keep stopping, that's your own, I mean, <laughs> that's, you know, tough. You're not getting paid for your time. You're getting paid for that final bit. I mean, I do, well, certainly with the books like Fiona's, because there's pronunciations and all that, I, I do all that. Though you can look up pronunciations till you're blue in the face, you're going to have to look at them again just before you say them. You uh -huh. can't, you know, unless you speak Portuguese, you're not going to remember. So you do have to stop and start. I mean, I know actors who do every character in a different colour. I'm not good enough with my iPad to even be able to do that. And occasionally I've tried to make notes on it and then I go, oh, well, that's highlighted in blue. Why? Oh, I didn't. I just sort of my hand slipped. So <laughs> it's completely bloody pointless. <laughs> um, I personally, I find once you've read a book, quite a lot of goes on in your head without mm -hmm. you knowing. It sort of jiggles around, you know, things make sense. Um, I, I think you get an emotional sense of the book, unless it's an up. I mean, I do sometimes do factual books. Mm -hmm. So there's that. So, and of, often you don't get the manuscript till really late, which is like a lot of my business. You go, did you not know this was going to happen? How come, why, why you booked me and it's not ready? But anyway, there you go. Um, so you don't always get a lot of time. You tend to read nine, I read 10 till five and you have a tea break and then you have a lunch and you have a tea break. But, and it's physically exhausting. Yeah, yeah. Because you have to stay so still. You can't, you can't move. So you have, you're very, very, there's a tension in you because of the way you're sitting. And if your stomach, you have to eat. If your stomach's rumbling, I have to do books with a stomach, a, a pillow over my stomach because <laughs> the tiniest noise, the tiniest creep. So you have to eat a lot of bananas and stuff, really. <laughs> um, and your voice gets tired. I don't lose my voice. And, you know, you're trained to do that. But towards the end of the day, I'll sometimes go, I don't think I should go on because I can tell. It yeah, just to, be able to keep it. Than it did. Yeah. yeah. It's an energy because you're so still and you have to have a lot of energy. So um, it's a lot more exhausting than people, I, I, as I said to you earlier, people go, oh, I've got a nice voice. I think um, <laughs> I should do that. And you go, right, on you go. <laughs> you have a go <laughs> and not all actors are great at it. You know, just because yeah. you're an actor doesn't mean, I was very lucky that I, somebody who owns a studio started me off years ago and he actually kind of taught me because there's things like rhythm. You yeah. can find yourself, you speed it up or slow down and you have to have like a metronome in your head going so yeah 
Yes. So thank you. Thanks. Do you know, it's lovely to get that insight because, again, I say it to authors about the finished product that we get. You know, we don't see all the blood, sweat and tears that has gone into producing a book. We just enjoy the book. And, and the same then with the reading, you know, to know that the discipline that's involved, you know, and as you say, that stress of making sure that you're still on top by the time you finish for the day. I, I wondered about the place that you do it. Do you go to a specific studio? Do you have the facilities Fiona's, Fiona's I do in one studio where I don't go a lot. You're usually just recording studios in London. Okay. Um, uh -huh. Proper studios with engineers. Yeah. Sometimes, some books you get a producer as well, which is good and bad, you know, that, so you've got someone either physical, well, not, nobody's physically anywhere anymore, but you know, you've got a yeah. producer down the line. Yeah. And that does help to have a bit of direction because otherwise I've had more contact with Fiona than with most authors. So usually you're just on your own making decisions about how to do it. Nobody really helps. So, yeah, you go to a studio. Great, great. Go yeah, Fiona, I'd, uh, yeah, no, Gabrielle and I were, were lucky enough to have, in fact, I insisted on it because I wasn't entirely happy with the audio of the first book. Uh, mainly because everyone's got a different accent and I can understand why the voice artist did that and she had no I probably had no kind of you know direction not to but but to me it didn't it didn't work and um, the second book is set in China and what I really didn't want was any kind of you really didn't <laughs> you know because Jackie you're a linguist you know that if you are speaking a foreign language to another person speaking a foreign language there is no, you know, there might be a regional accent. And I, you know, a film I think did this brilliantly was The Death of Stalin, yes. where where everyone speaks in English, but with a slight, you know, with, with their own Yorkshire or yeah. London yeah. or, you know, but, you know, there's no attempt to do cod Russian. And, sure. and so I was really anxious in the chemical reaction that, you know, you just accepted that, that how people speak and how people listen you know, it is not the same as someone speaking English with a Chinese accent, you know, yeah. if they're speaking in Chinese. So yeah. um, we had a great conversation early on. And I think it was something of a relief to you, Gabrielle, to know that I didn't want every character. Well, otherwise it was going to sound like, you know, bad Mike Yarwood. Or something. <laughs> yes, because, know. If, you know, I'm talking to myself. I've done that. I've had to do it in books where I'm doing Scottish, talking yeah. to Irish, but it's all me. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's terrible. And yeah. it actually detracts. Yes. I think distract, sorry, yeah. from the book. If you're, you know, too much acting in an audio book, I think is a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But but what I love about what you do is there's passion. So, you know, a lot of it can be can be quite, you know, as you say, without, you know, a regular pace. But you do speed up and you do slow down and there is rubato and there is all that lovely kind of, you know, that that's what I've really enjoyed about listening because I couldn't listen to the first one. I it just I just <laughs> put my head in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> so given what you've just been saying I wonder would now because Gabrielle's kindly offered to read a, a wee section from Chemical Cocktail and I think I think now would be a good moment is that okay with you Gabrielle? It is if I if I falter it's because my phone's got really tiny writing <laughs> <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how well I can see it but anyway yeah I'll do a little bit thank you The crunch of shoes on gravel jolted her from sleep. Jack Silver opened her eyes and raised her head from the pillar. Darkness enveloped her, just a pale sliver of moonlight stealing through the gap between shutter and window. No light inside the beach house. Mercurio had left her. Had he forgotten something? Returned quietly to avoid disturbing her. Quietly. She dismissed the thought before it had even half formed. A human tornado, Mercurio, was more puppy than panther. They'd argued before. He'd walked out on her before, but this time he wasn't coming back. Things were said that couldn't be unsaid. Honest things. Angry things. The holiday was over. She'd be alone again this Christmas. The footsteps were closer now, moving from the path to the veranda. A mosquito whined in her ear as she strained to listen. Crepe soles on polished wood. 
crinkly coagulated latex squeaking against the wide mahogany planks, slow and stealthy, moving round from the garden to the beach side of the house, furtive, up to no good. A thief? There was little of value here. If she had any common sense, she would lock herself in the bathroom and let him take whatever he wanted. But when the adrenaline flowed, she tended to follow the chemical messengers coursing through her body, which told her not to back herself into a corner, but to face trouble head on. Not a good place to stop. <laughs> Gabrielle, thank you so much. And, and right. so, viewers, listeners, that uh, passage takes place at the right at the start of the book. Um, and you just know that from then on, Jack is in danger uh, and she has to find a way of dealing with this danger. But there is also another story that plays underneath that is a very painful emotional story as well and Fiona you weave those two pieces together um in such a a unique tapestry I think um again Gabrielle thank you for for just giving us Fiona's writing with with I think as you say Fiona there's such passion there um I haven't and... read that since I think we did it in September or August <laughs> or something anyway yeah yeah <laughs> wonderful thank wonderful. you Fiona and again so we're talking about the two strands that you weave together and also the layout of the story there's a number of time frames and so I'm always curious you know how authors put these things together had you already do you do you write those two strands beforehand do you write the different time frames and then a bit like a puzzle do you move them around what what, what process works for you mm, I make a rod for my back so I I know Jack's uh backstory um inside out and in fact early on I did a desert island discs um for her so I I got Kirsty Kirsty Young to um in in my imagination imagination to interview Jack um, and Frank actually separately about their favorite uh, pieces of music and to talk about them and all I discovered all sorts of things about her that I didn't know from that Desert Island Discs um, and so that side of it I know quite well and I'm sparing with it because I've got 118 elements to go and we're only four in so <laughs> he's me employed it's fine <laughs> um uh, but the the opening scene was very much one that just came into my head, and I just I just I just I knew that's what I was going to start with. So I I, I heard other authors say this, and and as a natural planner, as a natural spreadsheet mm, um, yeah. sort of um, engineer, I I'm always surprised by how much the writing runs away with me. Um, so although I do have an idea of where I'm going, and the kind of some of the touch points. Um, I, I quite often find myself going in quite different directions once once things get hold of us. So I think somebody said that you write the first draft for yourself. Uh, the trouble is my first draft was kind of getting on for 150,000 words and, and I had a quick chat with my editor and she said, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to <laughs> find a way to, you know, to, yeah. to, 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 to snip that back. So, um, so books three and four are probably come together as a, as a, as a, as a kind of package. You will find out more in book four. Um, but yeah, the two the two strands, um, yeah, there is a bit of shifting around as you're going through the editing process. But I I quite like it in terms of writing because you get a bit I think a bit like Gabrielle when you're doing your ten to five, you 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 I mean very different, but you get you get tired. You, you know you 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 write something, you have a really good day's writing. It really freshens you up if you can jump to a different place and time and character for me anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. um so I love juggling lots of things at once um so it for me that was that was quite a fun way to write it um but it did mean that there was quite a lot of tidying up to do to make sure especially if I moved one section I had to then go back and make sure that everything else still worked yeah 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 and and you know it's I, again from the other side of that canvas to say that yes it does work. Um, 
but I, but I would say it's a it's a text that keeps you on your toes, <laughs> you know, and and it does. But, <laughs> but, but, but if if I can show the readers, and just get my copy here, see if it'll come out on the screen. What I like is, um, there we go. That you have these little symbols at the start of various chapters, so that you know where in the time frame things are happening. Which that's a great guide. Thank you. And and that was Jenny Parrott's idea, my editor, my wonderful editor. Um, she came up with the idea of rather than it saying twelve months earlier, yeah. she came up with the idea of of having the little symbols. So I think that's a a really good yeah. idea. I think yeah. it works it works beautifully. Again, you know, again within that chemical context. Although these just seem like pure alcohol and time. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 it helps having it here because I wondered then about it that there's. These detonation points through the book with different chemical symbol. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a little of insight? I your, can. Your, I'm going your to try. chemical expertise on <laughs> why. So, so first of all, as we all know, the elements, the 118 elements in the chemical table, a chemical um, a periodic table, differ by one proton and one electron. At any point, if I bored you to tears, you just tell me, you just put a big stop up. So um, the first seven elements, um, nitrogen down to um, hydrogen, was the ones I used for the countdown. So this has got this is meant to have a bit of a Bruce Willis kind of diehard feel in that you know it's set just in the in the days leading up to Christmas. Um, so I used uh, you know nitrogen to hydrogen as the um, as the kind of little uh, symbols for the you know seven days, six days, five days, the countdown to Christmas. And then I had to weave a little bit of the element in. Some of it was easy, like hydrogen was already part of the story. Um, but I cheated a little bit with things like beryllium by by giving people names like Beryl and Bernard. Because um, <laughs> it's quite hard to work ber beryllium into this story. Um, but yeah, so it was a little bit of a mixture of just having that 7654321 and also just trying to use, some of it was easy because it was already part of the story and some of it I, I just tw tweaked the names. Do you know, I, you, you said earlier, you know, that very often, I mean, I often feel this about, you know, teaching languages because I believe everybody can learn a language. It's just if you've had a bad experience at school as to whether it works or not. And I think the same thing. Yeah, I wish I wish you'd been my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you've been so into this, um, you know. And and you just thinking like your book, you, you know, you get. Oh, well, I think you get. I think you get three things for the price of one. You get a brilliant story. You get the social commentary, you know, that's there, and then you get to learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lovely. There's a lovely bookseller at break at Drake. A bookshop yeah. in Stockton yeah. called called Richard and and Mel and they they've been fantastic supporters. But Richard once said that every day is a school day with Erskine. It sure is. It sure is. It sure is. Uh, Gabrielle, have you while you've been reading Fiona's books? Um, I mean, I I know you do a lot of reading and things, so I'm not sure whether this is a fair thing to ask you. But is there anything? chemical that stuck with you again being you know being a non-chemist like myself um you know is there anything that or, or do you feel differently about this world now thanks to Fiona's oh yeah I, I absolutely it. feel differently but I don't know it's like you put me made me put me on my spot in class <laughs> I've learned absolutely nothing I mean <laughs> <laughs> I probably would when I was actually reading it, but, you know, I haven't read any for a couple of weeks or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, completely. That that it can be entertaining, and as I said, that it's relevant to me. It's all relevant yeah. to us. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm going to ask you both. Uh, I think there's a part in the text, uh, and again, it's one of Fiona's observations, but I think we can we can all do this. Um, Jack contemplates whether to stay and face the danger, fight or flight. She makes that choice. Uh, and she contemplates the footwear that her adversary is wearing. I think they're gold high heels. <laughs> uh, and, and her own footwear, which is very simple because she's coming off the beach, uh, it, it broken into this property. Anyway, we will leave that for you to read the book to find out what's going on there. But that idea of the right shoe for the right occasion. So thinking of the shoes that you possess, 
both of you. Are you the kind of person who buys shoes for the right occasion or do you buy the shoes because they just feel good? I think COVID's changed an awful lot of that. I think lockdown changed a lot of that. Uh -huh. I really do. Yeah, I seem to only wear white plimsolls. In fact, I think I've got some <laughs> sort of problem because I just buy a new pair every time they look a bit dirty. And I looked in a cupboard the other day and went, I think I need therapy. Um, so, yeah, but those shoes do affect you. And actors, a lot of actors work from the feet up if they're on stage or whatever they, you know, as far as their costume goes. Yeah. A lot of actors say they put the shoes on first because then it affects how you are, how you feel, how you stand. Um, so, yes, I can completely see that you could, you know, and yes, if you wear high heels, you're more, would you bear yourself differently? So, yeah, but not the not the right shoes for running away <laughs> when there's a gun pointing at you. That's no, the... then you need white plimsolls. So... <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> Fiona, your own footwear. How, yes, how well, well I'm, I, I, I mean, I definitely, I'm more of a comfortable shoe as I get older, without a doubt. I was never very good at high heels. I'm not very good at, you know, I just fall over in them. But I do, I, it is It is a kind of, it's always a dilemma when you're traveling and you're trying to limit yourself to carry on. Because as I say in, in, in the book, it's incredibly rare that anyone has safety boots in my size. So I do have to, I do have to carry my steel toe capped, you know, high, oh, high collared um, sort of safety boots with me. Um, and I don't have particularly small feet. I've got fairly normal female feet, but they're small for a man. Um, so if you do have to put that in your carry on, it kind of just about halves <laughs> the space yeah. you've got left. So, um, and if you, you know, if you do have an opportunity to go and visit, you know, I didn't want to go to the Taj Mahal in my, my safety boots really. Yeah. So, um, it, it's always been, it's always been a kind of thing that I've always thought how wonderful it would be if you could have, and, and most shoes that are meant to do both things do neither one nor t'other. You know, so white plimsolls, I think, Gabrielle, you know, it's a great, it's a great solution to many problems. Um, so, no, I'm not a shoe fetishist, but I do. I, I, I love shoes and I admire people who wear shoes well, you know, who've got dainty feet and lovely legs. But um, that's not me. So, um, um, yeah, and I, I do like feet. I'm really I, my husband's got beautiful feet. And uh, okay, I, sure. I do. I, I do think feet are really interesting and uh um yeah but the best of all is when you're in the beach and you can just have bare feet that's mm -hmm. that's definitely best of all that, that, yeah. that is the most most beautiful um I, now just to come away from the feet before it turns into <laughs> the fetish, kind of fetish yes. in a completely different direction <laughs> um, and and the, the thought of making those decisions when you are writing a novel and you mentioned how your editor had said, you know, the need to condense or the need to. Are you the kind of author that even though it might be slightly painful, do you find it easy to rid yourself of certain aspects or are there certain things that at all costs you are not going to leave out of your story? Oh, I really respect the professionals in this business. You know, if, if someone was questioning my engineering judgment, I might have a I might have a, a Barney with them. But when it comes to writing, I am so I am such an excited novice that, you know, I will take all the you know, all the help I can get. So and and you know, Jenny is almost always right. We've once or twice I've 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 fought for something that, that okay. I wanted to keep in um and and you know sometimes we've agreed to differ or sometimes we compromise but um you know when i look back at some of the ones that i you know i wanted in actually i think you know maybe i was wrong so by and large i will i will i will take advice um yeah it's it's and but i never throw anything away you know i i, I will take that chunk that i'm not allowed to use and i will store it up for some future you back. know when i can yeah. slip it past her without her noticing yeah. <laughs> I also noticed in the back of the book, because I'm always intrigued at the team of people behind an author. Yeah. You know, I think a little bit like on the stage or in TV, you know, we, we, we see you perform, Gabrielle, but all those people behind that make Oh, God, the... all the script editors and yeah. the producers and the lighting people and all the, uh, the editors and the sub-editors. And the, gosh, yeah. You know, that it's that is so much that collaborative venture. And 
Fiona, you mentioned your beta readers. Um, again, for people who aren't familiar with that notion, what do they do and how did you choose yours or did they choose you? Okay, so it doesn't work for everybody. Um, and I know I know that um, some editors are not that keen, um, but it, for me, there tends to be a fairly early, oh God, this is awful. Why am I even writing this? I, I just need to tear it up and start again. And that's where Lorraine Wilson, who's one of the finest writers I know who writes speculative fiction. She's just written a book called um, uh, uh, Where the Light Bends. Um, and she's just one of those wonderful, um, I met her on a writing course and, and I'm a huge admirer of her writing. So, you know, she's the one who gives me a cuddle and says, yeah, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit rough around the edges, but, you know, some good ideas. It made me smile. So, you know, keep going. Um, my my very best friend from school, who was the one who told me my writing was awful and I had to go away and learn how to do it right at the beginning. You always need a best friend who can just, mm -hmm. you know, that's the trouble with the likes of the Boris Johnsons of this world. You know, they just need a really good friend who just needs to kind of slap them around the chops and say, you know, behave yourself. Um, so I've got that in Marjorie. I've got a great friend in Portugal who who will... I uh, do a little bit of checking of my my kind of use of language. I'm sorry, Gabrielle, it just makes your life even more difficult. But I'll just um, go and weep in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and I'm just incredibly grateful to people who are willing to read because, you know, when before it's finished and it's rough around the edges, you know, it's 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 not everyone's cup of tea. And I do the same for not necessarily exactly that group of people. Um, so, for example, I wouldn't even, you know, I've read quite a lot of Lorraine's work when we were on a writing course together, but I wouldn't be much help to her, um, you know, with the sort of stuff she does. And, and she's such a, a you know, a, a brilliant craftsperson that, that I wouldn't be able to add very much. Um, so I'm always delighted to read for other people and I will only endorse those ones that I really love. I'm not, you know, I'm. Uh, but I but I'm very happy to read as a reader not as a writer but yeah. I'm very happy to read and say look this is what struck me or, or here's where I was confused or you know th th this is the bit I liked so for me it's really nice because I learned very early on not to give it not to give anything to my husband to read <laughs> well, was um, he too nice or not nice? no 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 he, he couldn't stand it so <laughs> Wow. he's yeah. he's definitely a kind of lit fic and experimental um you know how many how many how many books can we write without a vowel in them kind of work right okay stuff yeah. so he's a kind of george perrick a lipo kind of um guy um so no that wasn't that wasn't a good move um and and uh, you know narrowly averted divorce when he um you know i, I was gonna say <laughs> you know some things it's it's not worth it and you know, no, you can definitely find different, not no, no we can agree to, we can happily happily agree to differ yeah um but no for, so for me i find beta readers fantastic but what i will say is i don't always take their advice uh -huh. So uh, I, I, they're almost always right in that there's a problem, but then it, it, it is rare that someone else can come up with a solution in the end. That's your job. Um, but I, I find them really helpful to say, well, you know, this slowed things down or, you know, I didn't really understand how this fitted in. So, yeah, I'm, I'm dead lucky. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, just, I, I just want to backtrack a little bit. You mentioned the Portuguese. And you mentioned torturing Gabrielle in, in having to, <laughs> though, you know, I, I, I do love seeing, you know, that words sprinkled in just to, to give you that sense of where you are. So, Gabrielle, I'm going to ask you, I don't know where Fiona's going to take us. Well, yeah, you mentioned where you're going to take us in the next novel, but if you had a choice <laughs> for where Jack Silver was going <laughs> to go, on next on one of her most you know amazing dangerous adventures where would you like jack to go gabrielle you're talking in terms of what accents i have to do because in I, which I case can... you could just come to hamstead if you find. <laughs> deepest darkest hamstead it's dangerous there it really very is. very dangerous <laughs> a lot of mines <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh, I don't know. Let's say it doesn't have to be accent. It can just be a place that you've always wanted to explore, or where you've been and had an amazing Papua time. Papua New Guinea, Randa, Vanuatu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why there? 
I have a friend who lives there and I've always said I'm going to go and I never do go. And then recently there was a thing in the news about they captured some people in Vanuatu. Yeah. Who did they capture? What were they? The, you know, anyway, they haven't harmed them. They've let them go now, but it was some indigenous people had, had, had held these people hostage. They were from New Zealand, I think. It just always looks amazing. And my friend used to tell me about the shark nets around the island and all that stuff. Yeah. Wonderful. I will start my research immediately, Gabrielle. Yeah, and I'll, I'll work on the accents. <laughs> <laughs> not sure what it is they speak. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I like that. I like, and if that comes into being, we can say we mentioned it here. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. Anyway, anyway, I am aware of the time, um, and I know that you both have projects and 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 things to be getting on with, um. So I'm gonna bring our conversation much as it, it pains me to do so um I, it's such a thrill to be here with both of you and hear your thoughts on you know on writing and on on speaking that written word uh, and 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 what that brings um fiona i wondered about the next book um and you mentioned about that when 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 can we expect it not that we're greedy but we are so it's due for publication in June uh, this year, June 2023. Great. And um, uh, Gabrielle will be doing The Voice, I believe, which is fantastic. So hopefully going to the studio soon. Um, and it is a continuation. So we do carry on for where we left off um, with the, the chemical cocktail. Not all the questions are answered, but a few of them yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, and again, it's lovely, the, the threads that you give us um, and also that we mentioned in our conversation, you know, um, the aspect of vulnerability that you brought into Chemical Cocktail, um, you know, this this woman who is so capable, so confident, um, so aware of what's needed and when and how, but when things come close to home, then it, we see a different, you know, a different aspect of it. Uh, and and it, I thought it was beautiful, um, you know, a, a, a painful, a painful past that she has to come to terms with uh, and, and the aspects of that that she was unaware about initially. Um, and just to see her dealing with that. Thank you for giving us that aspect. It's also lovely, I have to say, when you have a series, because quite often when I finish a book, you mourn the characters, don't you? You go, <laughs> oh, I've lost them. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I lost her because she's not going anywhere. Oh, but God, it's yeah, so lovely yeah. that they still, you know, there's more and you learn yes. more because, yeah. yeah. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, that sense of, you know, we I think we do, we do invest in characters and we do yeah. want to know uh how they how they get on you know gabriel i'm thinking you know again of the work that you've been involved in in the past you know of the characters that you've played and people you know wanting to know oh god you know what is going to happen next week you know yeah or we could binge you know we we, we were waiting to find out what was going to happen to those characters and i think you know knowing that we could you know we've got another book coming down the line um, yeah and and I and and because you invest in them, don't you? Do. You? you you do. Really do. Yeah, and 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 I think you know. I think Jack Silver's the kind of character that you can find yourself thinking, "I wonder what she would do in this situation." <laughs> you know, how would she react? How Blow would she it get out of this? <laughs> if yeah. in doubt, if in doubt, Gabrielle, it's always my if in doubt. Blow it up. <laughs> And the other thing as well is I don't think I would I would want to be a close friend of Jack's <laughs> either because you, you know you're always living in fear of you might you know collateral damage in here and it's it's not. She and, definitely doesn't take any prisoners. That's that's for sure. She doesn't. She doesn't. Well, thank you both of you for our conversation around chemical cocktail. Let's just hold this book up one more time. Readers, listeners, I highly advise you to buckle up <laughs> and get ready for an incredibly bumpy but uberly satisfying ride. Um, and again, either take it on the page or if, as I did, take it through the ear and, 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 and listen and be transported. But for now, I wish you both uh, all the very best. Thank you so much. And... Hope to see you in person 
um, sooner rather than later. That would be great. Thank and you. and Gabrielle, a huge thank you for bringing it to life. It was such yeah. a such a joy to listen to. Thank you. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you for writing it. <laughs> <laughs> See Bye you. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.